Hello, and today we're going to be looking at something slightly different and a little bit more in the historical miniature category. And tonight you're in the deployment zone. Wings of Glory. The Wings of Glory, the World War One air game, is made out of Italy by Ares Games and was roughly 2012 when it was released, which makes it quite old in terms of the, an initial release and without any further revisions. Uh, there's a handful of FAQs and a few other pieces, but for the most part, the game itself is still solid and still holds for its entire length of its run. So the game comes with this handy rule book, which explains a few elements of how to obviously play and build up some scenarios. Um, it doesn't have much in terms of the actual historical element to it, so if you wanted to really delve into the history of the World War I aviation, uh, the pilots and uh, some of their grander exploits, that's pretty much up to you. Being a historical miniature game rather than a tabletop miniature game, there's a small difference. The historical game means that you agree with your opponent what the forces you're going to bring. Uh, so you might say I'm bringing the Fokker DR1 with uh, the Red Baron as the, the pilot, which comes with a, a number of skills that that pilot has, versus two or three of the other models. Or you could easily just go one on one and see how it goes. Do a Kobayashi Maru from a World War One point of view, and just keep playing until the uh, you know, the scenario plays itself out. The majority of air combat in World War I isn't really the same as the combat that was in the, um, later, obviously World War II and, and further on. Uh, the, there are elements for uh, more infantry-based activities, you know, putting in some anti-air guns and so on, and trench warfare. And so on. You've, you've got an amount of historical accuracy about how the ground impacted the air and you're able to move that forward and play it over a, uh, uh, even over the water. There are a handful of accounts of some sort of naval combat, air naval combat, just not much. The limitations of the, of the aircraft of the day definitely come into play. And that's, that, that fragility is, is reflected inside this game. So the game itself is it's a precursor to a number of other games. Uh, whilst the mechanic may not be 100% original in terms of the, uh, the styles and mechanics, those of us who remember some of the earlier games of the 70s and 80s can definitely draw upon, oh wow that's very similar to this. But as a modern game, with the modern devices, this game is very refreshing. You just put it out on the board, you can run it through, and you can be done and dusted within 45 minutes and get ready for another round. The creators of the game have got a point system set up through the website, the Nares Games. It's just that it's not a comprehensive system of points but it's more of a guide. Uh, ideally, this is one of those historical uh, games, much like Sails of Glory, which is another game that um, is made by Ares, and that is also, I bring this and bring this and bring this and you bring that and that and that. So the um, agreement that both sides would be as similar is up between the two generals or admirals or air admirals or whatever you want to uh, call yourself as you play the game. There's a long history with historical wargaming uh, going back to the 19th century and this really draws on that. So what we'll do is we'll have a look at the board, we'll have a look at the layout and we'll uh, run around for a little bit and see what it looks like 
as it plays out. Let's get moving. This is a mat that is available through Ares Games, although any mat is available, you don't need a mat, it's air combat, it's all two dimensional, um, sort of. The basic game is two dimensional, we have struts which you are able to keep adding and make height a difference, but that's an advanced feature which we won't be looking at so much today. But the idea is today we've got our two forces out in the air. So today we're playing with the SPAD S7 on the British side, the Royal Flying Corps and the Albatross on the German side. There are expansion packs for Americans as well as the Italians and other nationalities that had the Air Forces. As this is an historical game we establish starting positions based on an agreement and in this instance we have our two aircraft in their deployment zones and in their starting locations. This is a game that's also a little bit different in that we don't run with dice. So there are no dice required for this particular game although if you wish to use dice for any rules changes options or to flip a coin or whatever if you know there's a rules discussion on who may or may not be in um, line of sight and so on there's always something that may come up where it's a 50 50 and that's when dice rolling can be handy but it's not an actual mechanic of the game in any way shape or form each player or each aircraft has a maneuver deck And the pilot, or the, the player of the, the aircraft, faces down each card. These are the actions that the pilot will take, and after each action, if the opponent is in range, then we can take a shot at the target. What makes this kind of different is that both parties reveal their first card at the same time and actions are resolved at the same time and then shots are fired at the same time. Then the second move, if anyone's in range, again same thing, and third, and that's the end of round one. Then we bring the cards back in, look through the next lot of decks, we have to try and anticipate what the opponent is going to do, where the opponent is going to be, and since we don't have a large range, we then need to make sure that we are within range. So let's have a look at the first round. For one of these boards is about 68 centimeters, or roughly two foot three wide, by three foot two uh, or uh, 97 centimeters long and you can play it in that the space of either lengthwise or width wise these maps can also be placed together to create a larger campaign map if you wanted to build something that was a little bit more epic with a handful of aircraft you're able to run with up to about six on each side so whether that's six players or six aircraft it's just you can just run with um, an, or you can almost run with any number really I mean it depends entirely upon your um, the number of people and the amount of space you have to play with so even though both go at the same time we flip cards over and we see they are, and then fulfill that action. Thus. Now that both have moved, we can also see that neither are in range of each other. So no shots are fired in this first segment. 
in the second phase of the first turn. The albatross moved, as did the spat, and now we determine range and firing arcs. Every aircraft has a firing arc, and as long as you're within the firing arc, you're within range of shots. Both aircraft can shoot at each other, and again this is where we fall into a category of kind of different, as we have a damage deck, and based on the strength of the weapons being fired depends upon the characterization. This one is a B. This is a starter set kit, so these only a single deck. It's been shuffled, but if you had multiple starter sets or expansion kits, you get more decks of cards, and certain weapons have a different categories. You've got A, B, Cs, and Ds, depending on the volatility or the strength of firearm. So in a normal scenario you would have one deck for each aircraft but in this instance we're just running off the same deck and we just say that when we're shooting from here to there that's what's being issued out. When that's being shot from here to there that's what it is from there. So cards come with special effects. In this instance, they each take one damage. The spad has a pilot injury and smoke is coming from the albatross. With the pilot damaged on the spad and smoking from the Albatross, we now reveal our third maneuver. And now they're in a position to shoot. Now it's time for round two. And the cards are revealed at the same time. The albatross is performing what's called an Immelman maneuver, or a split S, which means the aircraft. There's a hook in. With the pilot of the British aircraft being injured, such manoeuvres are not open for that particular vehicle at the time. Also being an injured pilot, if the pilot suffers one more damage, then the aircraft is considered destroyed. The albatross fires on the spad, causing one damage and setting it on fire. Now that the spad has taken fire at the beginning of every round for the next three rounds, as in full gaming rounds, not segments, then the additional damage is inflicted upon the aircraft. There are other special effect rules such as damages to the mechanics, not being able to turn in a certain direction and so on, but generally pilots and fire were probably some of the most dangerous 
ones to take. So after the second phase of movement, the albatross can fire at spad and inflicts three damage onto the aircraft. The spad has suffered a total of five points of damage and can take a total of 15 structural points before failing and has taken one wound on the pilot meaning that the one more shot onto the pilot and the aircraft is also destroyed and is removed from the board. By the third action phase we have more movement but neither are in a position to fire on each other and so that's the end of round two. Now moving on to turn three the spad needs to take some more damage for being on fire and then we continue exactly as we did with the other rounds working out movement and figuring out try to uh, manage what happens next so we can see the uh, red baron's Fokker dr1 triplane and here's an example of how maneuverable this particular craft is and where its strength on the battlefield lay that sharp turn being incredibly tight and these models are beautifully painted and they're all pre-painted you can obviously strip them back and redo them should you wish to but um, for the most part many of the individual pilots do come with their own liveries so you are able to find some of the other uh, more specialized paint jobs for the aces. So just having a quick look at something that everybody probably wants to, to know a bit more about, the Manfred Richthofen Fokker DR1 with the maneuverability deck of D doing the A class damage deck with 13 hull points. It's a bit of a beast. And how does that look on the board? bright red and in the same pack with the Red Baron comes the Sopwith Camel of Arthur Roy Brown who was the one of the primary combatants for the final defeat of the aforementioned Red Baron and the Sopwith comes with its own level of uh, challenges with its maneuverability class being just a little bit different being C obviously dishing out the same amount of firepower and being just that little bit more structurally hardy sacrificing some maneuverability for some stability in the air so based on that gameplay from what we've seen you could easily equate the good old-fashioned pilots of the day as Knights of the Sky which I think is an actual game from the 90s and you can see it how they would like to strafe each other and just come in and just diving runs and just keep moving back and forth. When you look at the way that the aircraft worked back in the death back in World War One, it's pretty close to it. The this accurately reflects the level of hazard. Uh, you could be in a position of commanding advantage and then suddenly get a couple of shots uh, onto the pilot, forced to land and um, removed from the game. The way that the campaign modes work, you've got the obviously lingering damage, you've got mechanics involved if aircraft need to be fixed. Uh, you've got a number of different options on how you want to proceed if you wanted to go forward. A lot of it has to do with the agreement between two players and if you wanted to do a rough full air campaign across World War One, or at least for a particular section of World War One, you could do so. And with the various campaign, uh, with the various packs for expansions, you can do balloons, you can do zeppelins, uh, the big bombers, the big wide four engine, triple winged bombers, and so on. Taking into consideration the ground troops, put in a few trenches and make up a few uh, units to put on the ground. And you've got yourself a lot of adventure. 
the rule book quickly. It comes in a beautifully bound and set out in a very old style. If we could do sepia tones, we would. It fits all on a single tabletop and doesn't require a lot of space. So the game has a basic setup and a basic starter kit and then you add rules to make it more advanced and specialized the more familiar you are with the game. You could easily throw down two or three aircraft and simply just play or you could start building in various elements uh, uh, which is worthy of, of a good Biggles story. So with the packs you would like the uh, the main game, the base kit, kit you get some, uh, some ideas on how to build scenarios. Uh, there's a lot of options for different types of aircraft. I'm just trying to find a picture of one. So this is the range as of 2012 and as we can see there's a few more than that nowadays. But it's very similar. The aircraft are set based on their eras that they're in, so the earlier aircraft will be a little bit lighter and weaker versus the later aircraft once the construction materials have been designed and you've got a bit more grunt to how far they can go as well as how manoeuvrable they become. The, the Fokker triplane is by far one of the most manoeuvrable on the board, as you would expect. That's why Baron von Richthofen knocked up like 80 something kills. The game is straight out of the box ready, so you don't have to do anything. So on my scale of uh, miniature preparedness, zero, nothing, nothing to be done. All you gotta do is lay out some space, and make a space, put it on the table, and open up the how to play and just start. There's a few advanced rule books, a uh, few advanced rules on how to proceed if you wanted to add a few more elements, but apart from that, the complexity of the game is almost the same as when you start to when you finish. There aren't a lot of tricks with the different types of pilots. It's not like where you can have multiple um, rules in play. Having said that, there are actual named pilots where you can have that person's special rule. So whether they've got uh, an acrobatic pilot, whether they've got good gunnery skill, and so on. And they might um, have their own special effect, but it's all written down. So overall, the game itself plays very well and very easy. And with everything coming out of the box ready, it just means that when you start, you can just get on with it. Uh, the simultaneous nature of the game just it makes it so much, so liberating. You don't have to worry about my shot, your shot, my defense, your defense, how we're going to evade. Straight up, move, shoot, move, shoot, move, shoot, and getting yourself into position. Once you're in a commanding position, you're better off, but you're not in, uh, you know, invulnerable. And of course, once you add a couple of extra aircraft, that was just a one-on-one, -on -one, but once you've added a second aircraft, then you start to get the whole wingman element and you need to coordinate how your aircraft are going to move to stay in formation. And it's also worth noting that historically, how we fly our aircraft in combat today comes from this. And this is reflected very well in that. All right, so hopefully I've uh, shown through enough of the game to spark a bit of an interest, and I'm hoping that I've covered enough of it to be able to um, satisfy it for this week. Thank you so very much for your support and for tuning in and hanging on. Um, I look forward to getting on with it and having a look at something similar, but not quite the same. All right, so next week we'll have a look at X-Wing. All right, thank you very much. Bye.